What's up guys, welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name's Matt. This little chunk of iron here on the pallet is a two-cylinder Caterpillar pony engine. Now bear with me here because I got a little bit of a long-winded intro for you because I have to provide a little backstory since it's been so long since you guys have seen this thing. This thing has been making a mess for the entire year that it's been bouncing around in the shop too. Pig mat here. Anyway, by the time it's done today, all the fluids will be out of it so we won't have to worry about that. So this hunk of iron right here is a Caterpillar Pony engine. Now, maybe you guys have seen the videos on the Caterpillar D8H that I have. If you haven't, I'll, I'll put a link to those down in the description. They're definitely worth a watch. I think the D8 is probably my favorite piece of iron that I got. So the quick story, if you haven't seen the previous videos on the D8, is this was the original pony engine on that machine, and when I got there to revive that thing, it was full of water. We had just come out of a big cold snap, so it was amazing that this thing was even salvageable at all. Um, but somehow it had been sitting for years, seemingly full of water. It took a while, but we were able to get this engine running, and that was not without its own set of issues. The starter on this unit never wanted to engage. The teeth on the Bendix and everything on this starter and others that we had, we tried, um, none of them would engage. The only way we could get it to start was by loosening the bolts that hold the starter on, cocking it at some goofy angle, and then cranking it until it would fire, and then you'd have to let the starter hang back down and tighten the bolts afterwards, otherwise you'd be grinding the teeth on the starter. So, not sure what's causing that, but that was issue number one. After some time and fiddling around, we were able to get the diesel cranked up pretty easily, and we went back a few weeks later to load it out, figuring it would be super easy to get it restarted and load out. So when we went back a few weeks later to load out the D8, we found we had some bigger issues. As I mentioned before, the exhaust on the pony engine runs through the intake on the diesel engine. Instead of helping preheat the intake, in our case, we were actually flooding out the combustion chamber of the diesel engine with exhaust gases from the pony engine because the exhaust inside of the intake had rusted out. So in all the time it took us to figure out what the heck was going on with that diesel engine, we were running the pony pretty hard. I think we overheated it a couple times, and not to mention it was probably not in the best of shape to start with. After we finally figured out what was going on, we popped the intake loose on the diesel, letting some fresh oxygen get in there as we tried to start it. Got the diesel fired up, and no sooner did the diesel fire up than we heard a big loud bang come from the gear case here on the pony engine, and I saw that hole show up there along with the big crack. I don't know if you guys can see it. There's a crack running all the way up here. And, of course, it was draining all its oil out. So thanks to some super generous subscribers, I got a couple extra pony engines for the old cat. I was able to swap one of those new pony engines out with this one, and now the D8 is running and starting reliably. But I promised you guys a teardown video about a year ago, and we're finally getting around to it. So there's a good in-depth look at the outside visible carnage. There's a crack. It looks like it starts right up here. Goes down. Got that big chunk blown out there. And the crack runs all the way down and around out of sight there. Looks like the crack maybe terminates right at the bottom of that housing. So in the case of our D8 and all the pony engines that are this style, not only is this an engine over here, we have a two-speed gear case over here. So in really, really cold temperatures, you can put the pony engine into a low range and that will allow you to crank over the diesel at slow speeds till you get the temperature up high enough in the oil to where it'll crank faster. And then you'd flip it over to high range. So this guy right here is your high low range and she seems to be stuck now. It used to shift just fine. The other thing you have going on in here is your Bendix clutch. So as you can see, when you move this lever here, it pulls the Bendix gear into the flywheel. And there's also a clutch in there, so you're not just ramming it into a set of gears. I'm not 100% positive how that setup works in there. I've never had one of these apart, so we're going to find out together. This pony engine is nearly complete, minus the carburetor, so I'm just kind of curious how much this thing weighs. These new forklifts I picked up, they have scales in them. 
Uh, this one is not accurate. When I first picked it up, it said about 450 pounds, which sounds right. I guess the first thing we should do before I even bother to set it on the bench and start stripping it down is we should drain the oil out of this thing. There's the magnetic oil drain plug and it has got all kind of metal metallic paste all over it. That's the engine side. Gear case is still draining. Oh, the engine's actually draining now too. It took a second for the engine oil to actually start coming out so that plug is, is obviously jammed up there. There's some sort of blockage. Yeah, that's definitely not looking good in there. This stuff over here should, this stuff over here should just be the gear case. It doesn't look too terrible. All right, so here we are the next day, and I, obviously you guys can't feel this, but look at the sludge in the bottom of this poor engine. It is, it is bad. Oh my goodness. This is going to be bad. <laughs> yep, things are not looking good inside of this. Anyways, let's finally toss this thing up on the bench and uh, start tearing into it. So just as a little reminder of what's going on here, I'm going to throw some power at this starter, see if you guys can see, or at least hear. Starters are whirling and not engaging anything in there. Now let me loosen these bolts up. We'll try to crank that starter at a weird angle and see what happens. All right, I think we had to wedge it. A little something like that. Let's see if she engages now. Contact. Yeah. You guys hear the difference there? So just for giggles, I want to test this thing and see what kind of compression we're looking at on the engine side here before we tear this thing apart. You know what? It's a little bit better than I had anticipated. Look like we're at about 98, 95 to 98 PSI on number one there. I rate about exactly the same, about 95 to 98 PSI. So still pretty even compression. I'd call that pretty good, really. And you can't just say, oh, this starter's defective or whatever either, because we had tried, I think, two or three. I think we tried two or three different starters that my buddy Sam brought down for us to try, and none of them did anything different. They all did the exact same thing. So something is definitely not right in this center section, and that also seems plausible because of the hole in the case that we got going on here now. All right, so why do we care about the compression? Why are we even bothering to tear down this hunk of iron at all? Just... It's clearly no good. It's got a hole in the side of it. Huck it in the scrap bin and uh, go on about your life. Well, they don't make these things anymore. There's only X amount of them left in the world. And while they're not rare at this point, they are starting to get harder to come by. And uh, I don't plan on stopping to run any of this old antique stuff for quite a while. I plan on keeping this stuff going as long as humanly possible. So every little part off of here that is salvageable, uh, we're going to keep. I don't I probably won't scrap anything off of this. I'm going to tear it apart, show you guys what exactly went wrong with it, and that'll help give me an idea of what is still good in there so that I have a good idea of what I have for spare parts in the future. So, realistically, the motor section so far seems good. I mean, I'm confident I could get this to run just the engine. Something on this side of things, no bueno. So I guess I'm going to really start into this thing. I'll pull the starter, I'll pull these couple covers off the top here, and we're just going to start stripping it down from the back end all the way up to the, uh, the actual engine case here. Hopefully you guys can see there the teeth on the starter bendix there are all in acceptable shape. Very little wear on them at all. 
And from what I can see looking in there in the bell housing, it appears that the ring gear teeth are fine as well. So why isn't the starter engaging those properly? These are the mysteries that I am trying to figure out. There's our gear selector. That right there I don't think is good. I'm trying to get this bell crank to pop off the shaft and it's actually lifting the whole shaft up out of there. Um, that doesn't seem good. That seems like something that shouldn't be able to happen. There we go. There's your high low range gear train. Bearings still feel good in that. Teeth and everything look fine, so I'd say this part is good. We'll just go ahead and stick this over here on the good pile. There's a peek inside that section of the gear case there and you can see all the uh, swirly multicolor there. A lot of that's metal shaving, but honestly, for something that's this old and probably been neglected its whole life, I'm going to say that that's not really that bad. Anytime you have straight cut gears in an, in an oil bath, you're going to find a little bit of metal shaving in there, especially the older it gets, just from natural wear on the gears. It's not to say that there's anything that's wearing bad, um, but definitely Definitely always going to see a little bit of metal deposit like that. And a lot of it you can see is just this heavy, thick sludge. So that tells you... Uh, I'm pulling a bolt out here which I believe retains this uh, clutch shaft. So we can see down inside of our clutch compartment here, try to find out what's holding us up here. Well, I haven't discovered how to disassemble this thing yet. However, I did find some carnage. You guys see that thing wedged in between the gear case and whatever else that thing is there? That's a, that's a gear tooth down in there, it looks like. I haven't figured out where it came from yet, but... Sure looks like the profile of a gear tooth to me. Looks like I probably can't get this gear case any further apart without splitting it from the engine side, so that is what my mission is right now. I think I got all the bolts out. Hopefully this gear case will come off. That is a hefty little flywheel. I did not expect to see all that. I've never had one of these apart, by the way. I don't know if I mentioned that. I am learning right along with you guys. So there you go, we have a, a clutch pack right there. Looks like we got three steel plates and three frictions. And those engage inside of the flywheel there into those splines. And that's how you take the power from the engine and put it through the gear case, ultimately to the diesel engine. I'm seeing some carnage down here in the bottom of the gear case. I still don't see where these came from yet, so that's interesting. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. Look at all that metal paste down here. Oh, my goodness. That, that looks like a failure. <laughs> that ain't good. Still, I cannot see where these gear teeth are coming from. We're going to have to do some more digging. Oh, there's a plug down here that I haven't seen yet. Square plug. Well, there we go. That gives me access to drive that shaft. That shaft up through. Oh, you know what? Looks like if I undo this bolt, that whole assembly might slide out forward, actually. These little metal tabs just bend over the hex on the head of the bolt and lock that bolt in so it can't come loose. There we go. Sweet. So there we go, that's the clutch assembly. This bearing got quite a bit of rumble to it. I think this one's been given a couple hot suppers. This is an interesting piece. I'm not exactly sure what this does. It's shaped like it's a bearing ring. There we go. Okay, so we're pretty much 100% disassembled in this gear case. The only thing left is that shifter fork slider up there. And I don't really feel the need to knock that thing out because there's like some freeze plugs and stuff in there that retain it. We're going to let that thing go for now. There's clearly nothing wrong with it. So we turn our attention to the engine now. So as I cleaned out the bottom of the gear case, I found several more gear teeth down there. And... Apparently there's a few more missing from this puzzle because this is not make up a complete gear as you can see um, There's no Remaining remnants of it anywhere else though. I think the only thing you're gonna see left of it is this thick paste here That was in that bottom of that clutch housing. I Can't even exactly figure out where that gear went, but I Just know that it's no longer with us <laughs> The gear has left the chat as it were the other thing I noticed was on the engine here. I was looking across the face of the engine here and it looked to me like the gap between the flywheel and the block was bigger at the top than at the bottom. So I got a little curious and I threw a pry bar on it. <laughs> Houston, we have a problem. Now, a lot of these older engines do not have nearly the same tight tolerances that modern engines have, but uh, I'm like, I'm like 190% sure that uh, that that's out of spec. That extreme slop that is going on in those crankshaft bearings explains why the starter is not engaging where it should, because the crankshaft is not located where it should be. The whole flywheel assembly should be more like up here, and then the starter would probably grab it just fine, but instead... She hangs way down there, and the starter just misses it. So that's not good. I guess at this point, we can flip this engine over, and we'll pull off the, uh, the bottom half of the case here, and we'll see how this thing's put together. I don't believe these engines had roller bearings in them for the crankshaft. I believe they had Babbitt bearings, but we're going to find out. All right, to get the bottom half of this engine case off, it looks like we're going to have to pull the front cover first.
All right, first thing come off is this little bevel gear, and all this does is provide you a place where you can put an actual hand crank starter on this thing. Um, so you just have a, a crank that engages with these two little pins down in this bore, and you could start the pony motor theoretically by hand. I've never done it. I know it's possible, though. Next thing is our magneto here, and we're going to be careful with this because I know it's working. This could just be a direct swap. If we go out on a revival, uh, I could just take this thing with us, and slap it on the pony engine and rather than having to get in there and clean the points and everything this one was already dialed in and working yeah look at that all right so we got the engine cracked open here and everything looks good so far looks like this would be your camshaft gear gear on your crankshaft here runs up to a governor gear this apparatus slides in and out and operates your governor here and then the other half of this thing drives your camshaft, it looks like. So all that stuff has to be timed. We have it out of time now, uh, but no worries. I don't think it's ever going to go back together anyhow. We're going to pull the bottom off and see how bad the crankshaft bearing is on the other side. But let's check this side first. Oh yeah. This side of the crank bearing is not so hot either, but definitely not as bad as the other end. I don't know why they have these castle nuts pinned on here. We'll find out once we take them off, I'm sure. This is a good little trick for pulling out cotter pins, if you've never done this. You take your side cuts and you just barely bite down on that cotter pin and then use them as a pry bar because the, uh, the side cuts really dig in to the pin, get a good grip on it. You just got to watch if your side cuts are real nice and sharp, uh, you got to watch you don't cut the pin off. It's separating. There we go. I saw that coming. <laughs> you guys ready to see some carnage? Things are not looking good for the poor pony here. Smoked. That is the only word that I can use. This poor bearing is smoked. So what have we got to see here? Hopefully you guys can see the main journal there on the crankshaft is in pretty sore shape. It's got visible wear grooves all through it. Uh, I don't know if you could really get that turned and repaired at this point. It would probably have to be built up first. The bearing side of things is where it gets real. I was correct. There's no roller bearings or anything in here. It's just a bearing insert. Definitely, you can see like a big chunk of metal embedded in the bearing material there. It is just mangled very, very, very badly. This is the lower half, so all the gravity hangs down on this half, so I would imagine it's probably worse than the upper half. The opposite side here, I haven't separated out yet. Actually, the, upper, the other side here is a one-piece bearing, so to remove it, we would have to pull the crankshaft assembly undo this castle nut and that gear and then that bearing would slide off of there. I don't know that we're going to get that carried away, but man, she was, uh, she's in bad shape. Good bit of metal sludge in here. Kind of feels like, uh, you guys ever make one of the uh, non-Newtonian fluids like cornstarch and water, how it has that like hard feeling when you first hit it and then you kind of sink into it. That's about what this metal oil mixture feels like down here. I don't see any big chunks in it or anything. I didn't see it before we split it, but there's also some pretty mangled, chewed up teeth on this crankshaft gear too. She's in pretty, pretty sore shape from what I can see. But the camshaft lobes and whatnot, they look pretty good. They got a little bit of wear just from operating in that metal impregnated oil, I'm sure, but perhaps salvageable. Mm, bottom half to the cylinders, what I can see doesn't look terrible. Oh, we've got some damage on the bottom side of that piston. Can you guys see that thing's all scarred and nicked up? Things are not looking good for this poor pony. Yeah, we got some writing right here, something scribed onto the crankshaft. 1698. Looks like uh, rods have been done 20 over, mains are 20 over, on 1-2 of 73 by somebody with the initials of PC. That's pretty cool. 
neat little piece of history there. So stands the reason that the last time this engine was apart was 1973. I could believe that. <laughs> Can't even get this bearing out whole. Just falling apart. All right, I'm just putting this back on bottom case back on so that we can rotate the assembly. I'm going to pull the head off and have a look at those cylinders. All right, the last thing I want to do, we'll pull off this head and just have a peek down in there at these cylinders and see what they look like. Right now the block is still usable. If we had some fresh bearings and a good crankshaft, we could reuse this block. That doesn't look too awful bad. That's the number two cylinder here. All in all, she looks pretty good. It definitely looks like it's got some hours on it, but it really doesn't have any significant gouges or anything. I see one teeny little, teeny little line in it up there, about nine, nine o'clock position. Cylinder number one doesn't look quite as nice. Still not bad though. All in all, I think if we did a little hone job here. We could probably reuse this block. Keep in mind, it's just a visual inspection. I'm not actually checking this thing with mics or anything to see what it, what kind of specs we got. Okay, you guys saw how nasty that gear case is. I'm gonna go ahead and throw her in the parts washer here. Let it get good and cleaned up before I have to stick it on a shelf somewhere for parts. Check back with that stuff in a few minutes when it's done cooking. The rest of this stuff, I kind of didn't want to run through there. The front cover maybe could have, but I was kind of worried about drying out all the pieces of this governor assembly, maybe losing some pieces out of it. Uh, all these gear sets and stuff, I'd rather just leave them oily for storage purposes. A little bit of oil isn't going to hurt anything. All it'll do is protect it from rust over the years of sitting in a container. That gear case was so disgusting that I didn't even want to handle it, store it away. Maybe could throw this head in there too really, but it's not bad. All right, I ended up leaving for the night and letting this finish its cycle. How's she look this morning? A lot better. You can actually see it's yellow. It wasn't yellow at all before. Holy crap. You can see a lot more carnage too. So there's this crack. It starts, oh, it goes clear up to here. It looks like maybe, I think I see a very faint hairline starts all the way up here, down and around through the broken chunked out spot. Stems off into two cracks down here, but the main crack keeps going all the way down and around. It looks like it terminates right about there. Man, that whole half of the gear case is barely hanging on there. I don't think there's gonna be any save in that one. That would be serious, serious repair. Huh. Like I said, these things are not rare yet. They're definitely not hard to find, but they're getting less common every day that goes by. There's more and more of them wind up in scrapyards, unfortunately. I don't know that there's gonna be any save in this one, so I don't know that there's any point in storing it. Unfortunately, I think I'm just going to end up pulling off the remaining doodads like these oil plugs and dipsticks and we'll pull that shifter fork out after all. Probably going to end up scrapping that gear case. I don't think there's any point in keeping it around. These other pieces, parts we threw in the parts washer, look at that. This thing was so grimed up you couldn't even read it. Now you can clearly see where it says high and low. You can see the part numbers on all that. Clean this thing up really nice. Just this piece of square plate for the bottom. This came, this little piece of square plate was bolted on the bottom of the gear case like so. It was pretty grimy. Nice and clean now, we'll keep that. I'm thinking that's about a wrap for this poor pony engine. There's plenty of good pieces, parts here that we're going to hoard and save for future endeavors, but definitely some carnage. I don't think we're going to be rebuilding this particular unit in its entirety anytime soon. At the very least, I'm glad we got a little bit of closure on this and uh, just kind of know for sure what exactly went wrong and what caused the failure. And uh, 
what to look for in the future. If we ever come across another D8 pony engine and the starter's not engaging, well, we know things probably aren't going real well in there. I never did figure out what those gear teeth came from, so I'm gonna have to study the parts book, I guess, and see if I can find a very small, like a six or seven tooth gear. The trouble is, looking through all these pieces parts, I really couldn't see any place where there was one missing. You know, usually you'd see some remnants of it, or there wasn't even a place on the shaft anywhere for that woodruff key to go. So, if you guys are familiar with these things, any of you guys in the comments think you might know, drop a comment down below, let me know where that little gear is supposed to go, because I'm pretty perplexed about that part of this. While you're down there leaving your comment, do me a big favor. If you like this video, don't forget to hit the little thumbs up button there below the video. It really helps out the channel. It doesn't cost you guys but a second of your time. If you want to help support the channel in a little more direct way, head on over to dieselcreek.com. We've got the merch store over there. We've got hats, t-shirts, hoodies. We're working on zip-up hoodies by popular demand. We've got zip-up hoodies on the way. I've just uh, tested out the latest of those, and I'm, I gave them the green light, so we're going to be having those in the store here real soon if they're not there already when you watch this. And we're coming into springtime. We've got some new t-shirts in the merch store. We have by popular demand again we have the 977 track loader t-shirt now available in adult sizes previously you can only get that if you were one of them little guys but now we can be big little guys too so if you want one of those shirts they're available now over at the store that's dieselcreek.com link is always down in the description but that's all i got for now i'm gonna go eat some dinner thank you guys for watching i'll catch you later